Okay, so a very warm welcome to you all tonight on this really cold night as we're here for another of the 1916 committee monthly lecture series here at the Katie Club in Rhode Island. And I'd like to start as we usually do with asking for a moment of silence for all those who have given their lives for Irish freedom. Thank you. So we are living in historic times. In 2021, we witnessed the 100th anniversary of partition, the event that led to the establishment of a Protestant state for a Protestant people. Yet last year, we saw Sinn Féin emerge as the largest party in the North overturning decades of unionist majority, a true sign of change. In 2017, we had the calamity of Brexit. Yet amidst that turmoil, a new opportunity for Irish unity emerged. And as we approach the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, an agreement hard won that brought so much promise and that did deliver peace, but an agreement that has still to be fully implemented. And we're still in very turbulent times. The chaos in Westminster with the constant turnover in Tory leaders, the DUP still unwilling to respect democracy, and the legacy issues resolved, with the British government pushing through laws to shut down any investigation into conflict-related deaths. But despite all this, there is a growing excitement, new hope. We have a phenomenal opportunity to realize our dreams of Irish unity, and we all have a part to play. Is that speaking? And that brings me to tonight's speaker. Kieran Quinn is the Sinn Féin representative for North America. And he will provide us with insights into the current political situation in Ireland. Now, Kieran is originally from Belfast and has been a longtime activist in his community and for Sinn Féin. He now lives in Dublin, but spends a considerable amount of his time traveling back and forth to the state, keeping US representatives up to date with the current state of play and the challenges ahead. He has great insight for us as to how we can really influence things back home. And I don't think I have to convince anyone in this room that Britain will never willingly act in Ireland's best interest. But historically, they have responded to Irish-American pressure. So we have a very important role, and Kieran will speak to these issues, update us on the state of play, and inform us as to how we can impact change. So let's give a very warm welcome, please, to Sinn Féin representative Kieran Quinn. Just a wee bit bigger, but Tristan. Well, it's can you hear me okay? Yeah. Not far enough. Yeah. Could you ask? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're just thinking of the, the Terence McSweeney quote. It is not those who can inflict the most, but those who can endure the most. We'll see victory. Anybody who made it out tonight in that weather and that wind can endure quite a bit. Victory will be ours on the basis solely of being able to hold back the cold. I'd like to thank you for the invite to come, even though it was under false pretenses. Mike, Mike told me coming come in February, it'd be lovely. I got a really, I got a really warm welcome, not from the weather. 
Uh, Mr. Patricia said, I, I think it's the flavor of what's happening. Um, and then we can take questions because I find you know, that might be the best way to get the interaction going and what people are thinking. And just a, a couple of things that have struck, struck me today. And I was in Hartford yesterday and been in Springfield in Boston. Tomorrow I'm going to travel on to New Bedford. And I, I've sometimes I've, I think I've got the greatest job in the world. I don't know, yeah, I get to travel and get to meet people. What's that connection that continues and is living and breathing between generations of Irish Americans and from there's something very special about the Irish American identity. That hyphen means so much more than any other identity in the US. And it's that sense of longing and kinship of immigration and people who are forced to leave many over generations, not by choice, but out of necessity. But there's always that link back to home and that interest. You know, it's, it's shaping and has shaped Ireland and shapes our politics today, just as it has through our histories. And so we stopped off at the Fama Monument. It was a lovely sunny day. <laughs> it was a lovely sunny day, but Jesus, it was cold. <laughs> it's very affecting when you see the Fama Monument and you think of what people had to do. People fleeing poverty and hunger to come here and find refuge. And their families are still here, those who have prospered. And we've seen the 1916 monument. And again, the sacrifice, 1916 was only made possible with Irish America. There would be no rising without people like Tom Clark, who was a naturalized American citizen. James Connolly came as a union organizer again. And fundamentally, the money that came, was raised in the States made the rising possible. No two ways about that. And the U.S. has been central since then. And for every generation of revolutionary leader who came through the U.S., right from Wolf Tone, right through to Joe Cahill, uh, Jerry Adams. And I suppose, looking back then, you're following the footsteps of all those people, everybody that's came before us. So our struggle, this is a different time we're in now. And Tricia says it's full of opportunities for us. And our struggle has changed. But the end objective still remains the building of a united and sovereign island, free and independent island, a home for all who share the island. And Patricia just gave a, a very short synopsis of the changes that have happened in Ireland. So we are in a kind of huge opportunity and great change. Whenever Ireland was partitioned, the North was 66% Protestant and 100% Unionist. For my grandparents who were growing up in that state, or my parents who were growing up in that state, there was no place for them in it. They were Irish Republicans and Irish nations and Irish citizens in a state of which they were trapped. And there was no reflection in that state of their identity, their hopes, of their aspirations. And we went through then years of conflict. We went through the longest period of continuous conflict in Irish history. From 1969 till 1998. And all of the repression that came of that, it was every decade since partition was marked by internment, censorship, there was repression, there was resistance. But again, we've come to a point where our struggle has fundamentally changed in the last 25 years. And I'll always, and I come back and repeat this the nature of stru that struggle has changed, our end objectives still remain. It's about achieving Irish unity. And that's where I think this generation, the times that we are living in, are different from all that came before us. We have an opportunity that was denied the people of Flat Island and Famine, people who were responsible for the 1916 rising, and the people in the 1981 hunger strikes. We have an opportunity that was denied Bobby Sands and Maria Farrell in that generation. We have a, a peaceful and democratic pathway to Irish unity. And it's just looking about, the, the, if I can give a short piece about the changes that have happened. So we, Ireland was partition, it was, as I say, 100% unionist in the north. In the last elections in May, Sinn Féin was returned in the north, it was the largest party. Sinn Féin Vice President, Michelle O'Neill from Throne, is now the first minister-elect, the first Irish Republican, the first non-unionist, and the first Catholic to hold that position. And a state that was designed to prevent that happening. 
And those changes are all around us. Give an example of the election numbers, being a bit of a election nerd. The assembly sits in the north. There's no longer an automatic unionist majority. That unionist majority hasn't existed for the past five elections. There's a one seat advantage of the night of a unionist party to their nationalist parties. One seat. And in voting terms, if you aggregate all the votes that went for the United Irish parties and then the ones that went for the Unionist parties, the difference was 0.6%. Less than 1% of a difference. And again, that's a fundamental challenge that how the state was established and set up. So to move that needle, that 1% to 2% in terms of that election, isn't a big ask, and that's the possibilities and the opportunities that we now have. And I always tell people, it's an opportunity. It is not an inevitability. It'll come down to hard work. It'll come down to continuing the work we have been doing if we're going to achieve the type of Ireland that not just honours the generations that came before us, but also is our legacy to the children who are coming afterwards. And we're going to build an Ireland which has been on like what has came before the changes haven't been just haven't just been restricted to the north. In the south, since partition, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael both managed government and opposition. They swapped around. So there was no alternative to those parties. That changed in 2020. Sinn Féin was returned as the largest party in the south. Mary Lou Macdonald, our president, became the first woman. To be the leader of the opposition, I don't think it took a hundred years for one to get that position. We hopefully will, it'll not be too long before we get the first woman, Taoiseach, first Sinn Féin leader to run, to lead the opposition. And again, it'll not, we hopefully it'll not be that long before we have a Sinn Féin Taoiseach. And just think about this, about the nonsense of partition. Well, we could end up having a government in Dublin, led by Sinn Féin, and a government in the North led by Sinn Féin. That is not an impossibility. There's a lot of work that needs to get done to secure that. And these are just markers of the changes that are now happening across Ireland. And I suppose if you go back to well, how this come about, fundamentally, the Good Friday Agreement set Ireland on a course which has been irreversible ever since. Change the nature of the North and change relations North and South between the island of Ireland and Britain. And some people think the Good Friday Agreement was a settlement. It was something that was done 25 years ago and it was all over after that. You know, it developed peace, yes, but it didn't settle the dispute. The Good Friday Agreement isn't a settlement. It never settled the constitutional question, it sat down the, the ground rules for how it would be tackled and how you would deal with political issues today. So it made it very clear in the Good Friday Agreement that Irish unity is in the hands of the Irish people and the Irish people alone. There will be referendums north and south. And if those referendums, if that, those referendums vote for Irish unity, an Irish government and a British government are now legally obliged to legislate for that. It's now possible. And it's the will of the people who will determine it. And over those 25 years, we have seen the changes which I just described. Where the state in the north has been fundamentally changed, and the state in the south has been fundamentally changed. And the Irish unity debate is alive. And it's not just a northern issue anymore. It's an issue in the south. A whole new generation have been priced out of homes, healthcare. It's a generation who are going to earn less than their parents, which is the first we always have aspirations that our kids would do better than me, not we would do, we have done. And a lot of that is paid out. It's not, it's not, that's, not the, that's not the opportunities that young people are facing now in the 26 counties. And they're looking at Irish unity, not just about adding the North onto the South, but creating a whole new state, taking the best of work of both and creating something new. And that's a very exciting opportunity. To be the generation that can build a new state, can define a new nation. Can you imagine if you had that opportunity to do that in the US? By taking what's, what's, how you, the fundamental changes you would like to see. 
That's the gift that's in the hands of the generation now and Adam. I'll go back to the point. It is not, it's all about opportunity. It is not about inevitability. It's about how we make that happen that we have to look at. And that brings us to the point that Tracy says is, well, what's the role of the US? And the US's role hasn't just been about 1916. The US was an Irish American, was central, making sure Jerry Arms got a visa in 1984. That led to uh, the appointment of a special envoy in George Mitchell, which led to the Good Friday Agreement, which led to the opportunities that we now have. And I would say, Trisha mentioned Brexit. Since the Brexit vote, the US has been more engaged in Ireland than in the previous 10 years or more. And it's been a positive development. Because the, the US, the Good Friday Agreement is as much your agreement as it is ours. It was the US acted as a, an arbitrator for it, not just George Mitchell, but President Clinton, and every president since then has acted to ensure the Good Friday Agreement is honored. I, I don't need to tell you about American politics and how fractured it is in terms of Congress. But there's one issue that unites all sections in Congress, all parts of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and that's Ireland. It's the one issue which will get unanimous support in terms of support for the Good Friday Agreement of Protectment. It was the unanimous position of the US government and the Congress. There would be no trade deal with Britain if Brexit resulted in a hard border across Ireland or undermine the Good Friday Agreement. And be under no illusion, the British government were quite content to see a hard border in Ireland. They never gave us a side of thought. The people in the North voted against Brexit and it was imposed against the wealthy people by our, our British government. They were quite content of a hard border. You know? They're quite content to undermine the Good Friday Agreement. It was America that acted and brought Britain to the negotiating table and have held Britain to the negotiating table. They made it clear no trade agreement with the US if Brexit undermined the peace stability, the economy, the Green Friday Agreement. And that came about, one, because of the involvement of the people in Congress, but it came about the involvement of the people in this room. We talked to the Congress members. We advocated across the states for this position. So there's a lot of power in this room in being able to shape politics still back at home, politics here. The Brexit issue hasn't been resolved. As I say, the US has brought the British government to the negotiating table with the EU. That pressure needs to be maintained, get an agreement, which is going to be lasting, which is going to make sure that there's no hard border and that the uh, prosperity of the island is protected. So it's still that piece of work that needs to get done on that issue. We also face the British government, not just on Brexit, but as a cavalier attitude to the whole the Good Friday Agreement and believes that they can act unilaterally. The Friday Agreement was an agreement between the parties and the two governments acting together to reach a joint agreement. The British government, they believe that they can act unilaterally, not just on Brexit, but on issues like legacy. So currently, there's, there's a piece of legislation going through the British Parliament, and it's probably one of the most insulting pieces of legislation ever drafted. And you might think that's a bit extreme. The British government said it's about reconciliation. But what it's actually about is about continuing to cover up for their actions. This piece of legislation will mean there will be no police investigations in the actions carried out during the conflict. There will be no inquests, and there's inquests have been outstanding for more than 15 years. So families will know the circumstances of even how they're not on the There will be no police ombudsman's investigations in the wrongdoing by the police during that period. And if you were the family of a loved one, you can no longer take a legal action through the courts to try to get that information. I might say, well, is that just Sinn Féin's approach that? This piece of legislation is opposed by every single party in the North and the South and the Irish government and the British Labour Party and the UN human rights rapporteurs and the EU human rights rapporteurs and the churches 
and the government appointed own UN uh, Commissioner for Human Rights and the Commissioner for Victims Issues. No one supports this part of the British. The other group who have come out against this is the US Congress. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, 27 Congress members sent a letter to Vichy Sunak saying this legislation needs to be approved. Now, the British government are still proceeding with that. I have no doubt that if they continue with it, this will eventually end up in a European court and will be overturned in a European court. Problem is this, that process could take up to 10 years. We could short circuit it if the Irish government were to take a case, which they should make clear to the British government they will do it and shorten it to two years. The British Labour Party said if they're in government, they will revoke the legislation. That is why all in this piece of legislation is fundamentally undermines the human rights commitments of the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement made it clear that the European Convention on Human Rights had to be incorporated into law. These proposals run a rough shot through that because it undermines the rights of victims to free investigations. I don't need to tell you how erroneous it would be if someone was to say you cannot take court action against the killing of a about the killing of a loved one. That's what families are facing in the north. And it's driven by one reason, and that is the courts are beginning to expose the extent of British government, British military killing, and also their involvement in collusion. And this is just a way of continuing to cover that. There's a piece of work already to be done in terms of legacy to get the British government not only to remove these proposals, but to come back to what was agreed. What was agreed in Good Friday by the European Convention on Human Rights. What was agreed in Stormont House in 2014. What was agreed in the, the New Deal, New Decade Agreement in 2020, which says the British government would legislate the Stormont House was with so again, there's an instance where British government have undermined three of their own agreements and went their own way against the opposition of everybody. We need the British government to get back to being partners in the peace process and honouring their agreements. That's not a big ask. I mean, that's that's just how we live our lives. If you if you're trying to buy a car and you strike a deal over the price. You don't expect the person to come back and raise the price when you go to pick a car. If you act in good faith with your family and friends and business people, you expect them to honor their agreements. And that's the, the British government we've been dealing with. Do not do that. But the US has got a huge role to play. They've done it with Brexit to bring them back or table, and they can do it again in terms of these other issues like legacy and coming back to the peace process. So that. And I'd like to begin on the opportunities we face and they're the challenges we face, but none of them, the challenges aren't unsurmountable and the opportunities need to be met and explored. So in terms of the Irish unity piece, <clears throat> say we deal with stuff in the here and the now, legacy, Brexit, getting the institutions in the north up and running, but we also have to keep an eye on a lot of the bigger picture and that is about how do we build United Ireland. And if you work your way back, somebody wants to put this question, a Republican, an Irish Republican, put this question to us. Okay, you've got a United Ireland. How did you do it? How did you do it? What steps need to be put in place? So if you start working your way back, if you've got a United Ireland, that means you've won. A unity, the unity referendums that were in the Good Friday Agreement. But how did you do that? You planned, you prepared, you put forward your case, you convinced the maximum amount of people, and you won a majority. And the majority is 50 plus one. We want more than that. We want the maximum number. But there are the rules. You think, well, well, what does that mean? That means, well, you have to prepare, and you have to plan, and you have to go out and advocate and convince people at Irish Unity is the way forward. And there's a growing number getting that. So who does that? We all, civic society, all political parties, will be responsible for that. The key one is the Irish government. The Irish government, under the constitution, have a, an obligation to secure Irish unity. The two parties here in the Irish government at the minute 
is Fianna Fáil the Republican Party and Fine Gael the United Ireland Party. Yet neither of them are acting as advocates for Irish unity, and both of them are refusing to plan and advocate for unity. You start to be published, like a citizens' assembly that you call to start thrashing out these issues. These are all very simple things. And as I say, I think every political commentator will say there will be a unity referendum. There'll be a debate about the time scale of it. Is it three years, five years, ten years? But one's coming, and yet we have an Irish government with Barry and Seth and Sand in sand on this issue. So, what can you do about that? Ask the Irish government, why aren't you planning? Why aren't you preparing for unity? It's the common sense thing to do. Any government worth itself will be planning for scenario for different scenarios for five years down the line, 10 years down the line. We build roads on the basis of planning for 50 years. Let's plan for Irish unity. That's the Irish government doing it. Sinn Féin's a government. That's what we will do. And we will prepare, we will plan, and we will persuade for Irish unity. And that's what the Irish government should be doing. So then, that's one thing that could be done at this stage. I mean, what is the role of the people in this room talking to the Irish government with unity? And then there's another step up. If we have, if we want a unity referendum, I mean, we have to secure a unity referendum. We have to get one, but we have to agree a time and a date for a unity referendum. Again, that comes down to the role of the Irish government. And these aren't, we're not asking for things that aren't already agreed. A unity referendum is already part of the Good Friday Agreement. And there'll be people who say, now is not the time for a unity referendum. Or my favorite, if you want to turn logic on its head, you know, a unity referendum would be divisive. <laughs> it has been said, a unity referendum would be divisive. As if partition was a unifying thing. No, so. All we're asking for is what is the face of this burying your head in the sand, ignoring it, the issue, not planning. But fundamentally, denying people the democratic right that they were granted in the Good Friday Agreement is divisive. But North of Ireland and South of Ireland are the only places in the world where people will we can't plan for five years. We can't plan for the future. What does the future look like? What does government look like? So, why is the time to start planning? Yeah, it's time to say we're going to have a, we're going to have a unity, and we're not looking at a unity referendum in six weeks or three months. We want the process laid out. There's consultation, there's discussion, there's debate. What? what? I'm thinking two to three years. What? Three, three, five years. Five years. We've been at this for over eight hundred. We've got a bit of time to get this right. This feels. Yeah. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Says, <laughs> That's why it just says my name up there. And that, that can be put together. So there's, there's room for you to talk to the Irish government. There's room for you to talk to Congress members here about protecting the Good Friday Agreement, enhancing the Good Friday Agreement. And if you talk about protecting the Good Friday Agreement, that means protecting the right to unity referendum, the way to deal with it. And I suppose that the other thing is that Sinn Féin can't do this work on our own. The people in this room can't do the work on this work on their own. So we have to think about how do we build the last. And I mean, Irish America is as diverse a group as any other ethnic group. There's right and left splits, there's class splits, there's also. But what we've found is the one thing that unites all Irish America is they want to see a United Ireland. So how do we build coalitions? in the U.S. across Irish American groups to start talking about unity. If we put pressure on the U.S. political representatives, the enacted commitments of the Good Friday Agreement, and put pressure on the Irish government to it. So there are all parts of the discussion that Jews can take forward. And I think, for me, I let out the question is probably also, how do you achieve, what is it, how have you achieved the United Ireland? We'll put the question about Jews. What's your role? in doing this. And the first thing I always find is that people think of the idea of Irish unity as 
That's a wonderful aspiration. That's a great vision to have. That's a great hope for the future. That's not what it's about. We're activists. We're not spectators. The question to put is, how do we bring it about? We can achieve Irish unity in our time. We can create a new and united Ireland. We can create an Ireland which is a home for all of our people. We can't create an island which can house our people. We can't create an island which will help health care for our people. And we can create an island where no generation is forced into immigration against their will. That's the opportunities that we have now. That's the opportunities we want you to be part of building. And that's the opportunities that Irish American bring to power. And as I say, none of this is inevitable. A friend of mine once said, you call it a struggle for, the re for a reason. If it was easy, what have we called the easy and what have we over 700 years ago? It was hard work involved in this. But we can do this. That's a big thing. It is no longer about an aspiration. It's no longer about a song or a... It's no longer about going back to wood and not be great. We can do this. And this is a generation that can do it. And Jerry Adams... At the beginning of it seems so long ago, at the beginning of COVID, done a Zoom meeting. <laughs> and he said, there's a group of Irish Americans, he says, you could be the first generation to come back to a free and united Ireland. Travel north and south, be part of a new nation, part of a new state. That's the opportunity in front of us in this room. And the gallery where you can make it happen. Thank you. There's a big show of hands. There's nobody no one wants to ask the first question. <laughs> um, not really wanting to um, take the necessary steps. Well, they controlled the state. They have controlled government and opposition for 100 years. They're now in government together. And they're not in government because people say, oh, this was this was the end of the, the civil war and this is some sort of reconciliation. No, there's one thing that brought these two parties together. That was to keep Sinn Féin out. That's the only common agenda. So yeah, they have never prepared or never planned for unity for 100 years. They were quite content to manage the 26 community state. So it's all about the challenge. <laughs> They're very much about the establishment, it's about the challenge, and a new island will be a new island, and it means they will not have their hands, they, it's not guaranteed that they will have their hands in the Asian part. By the way, that doesn't mean Fianna Fáil or Fianna will disappear in the United Ireland, but it'll be a fundamental political realignment, and they have never risen to the challenge of having a policy or a program for Irish Union. And the only driver is it's about containing and maintaining the power that they've had in the state. Okay. But, but you know what? That's a fabulous question. They asked the Consulate General, when you meet them on the Irish ambassadors, or Irish, poli Irish politicians, why aren't you planning for unity? You're doing it. Thank you. Um, maybe everybody knows. And then, if there is a referendum, what would... <laughs> they're, 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 great, they're great questions. One of them I can't answer very quickly. And that is, in a Good Friday Agreement, if there's a unity referendum, uh, if a unity referendum is called and fails, all the, great, the agreement says is there cannot be one for another seven years. So that doesn't mean there'll be one every seven years, right, but there yeah. can't be one within, no. within that seven year. Yeah. So the other piece is that by the agreement, it's the British Secretary of State will call, so the British Secretary of State has the power to call a unity referendum in the North at any time. So they could call one tomorrow for six weeks time. 
as a way of going. So the people think, well, that would stop their being one for at least another seven years. Yeah. So they could do that, they have the point of view, but they're compelled to call a unity referendum. They shall, or they must call a unity referendum by the Good Friday Agreement if they believe that constitutional change is a majority in favour for constitutional change. But there's a debate about well, what does that mean in practice? How do you measure that? So I'll give you an example yeah. of the, the voting. 0.6%. There's no unionist majority in the assembly. There's no unionist majority over 50% in the last five elections. That 0.6% doesn't include the Alliance Party. So where do their votes go? So, and it's a, a straight, it's always struck me as a strange thing. A referendum will be called, a British minister will call a referendum whenever they know what the results of the referendum is going to be. It's not quite the most democratic way to do it. So the easiest way, instead of trying to second guess polls and second guess work people don't know, just ask them. Ask them. Put the plan forward and see what people say. If you give any referendum falls, we will continue to work the status quo as we have for the past 25 years. And it'll be peaceful. We will continue to advocate. We will continue to plan and build for our unity. We can live that for some time. We can live with it and we'll, we'll plan for the next bit until the next time. We need to use the same thing from unionism, by the way. The day will abide by what the Democratic Act can do. But for your question, who calls it? It's a British side of state. Reality, that means an Irish government, talking to the British government to call it. And what's the threshold for calling it? I, I would argue that threshold has been mad now. It's a grey area where people well, we don't know how people vote. Just ask them, give them the vote in a referendum, have the debate, have the discussion. We're all grown ups and accept the outcome as it is. I don't know if that answers the question. Hypothetically, if all, <clears throat> all the parties agreed to have an election, and most of the polls would be saying that, let's say, uh, for unity at 51%. Mm -hmm. Would Sinn Féin as a party agree to go forward with that at 51%? Or would they maybe wait a little bit longer So we got 54 or 55? Would they have a solid majority for it? Well, I know it's a, it's a hypothetical okay. question. No, no, no. So like, I, I take a back there. The rules, the rules are set, the rules are agreed. The Good Friday Agreement made it, it's a majority, it's 50, it's not even 51, it's 50 right. plus one. Right. So that's, and that is the democratic threshold for any referendum. The, the, the divorce referendum in the South was passed by, I think, 0.3%. 20,000 votes just. Different animal. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no, I'm just saying, so the, that's the threshold, that's what democratic threshold is. We want to see the maximum amount of people. We would, I mean, I, I would say I would take 50 per, per one. I would want 100% and I'd sell it for any round between the three. Okay. So that's that's the, the key bit. But I, I think when the debate becomes loud, when an Irish government are advocating for it, when people see what a new and United Ireland looks like, I'm confident that a sizable majority will come in. But that's my hope. And for the people, and the other challenge on the other side of a referendum is this. We also have to make the Ireland a home for the people who didn't vote for Irish Union. We have as right, we have as much right to Ireland as I. So we have, and that's why I come back to this is about creating a new Ireland. It will not be the same as what we've had in the past, which is very exciting. It has to be a home for all. So we even, and I've, we have met with, we have been involved in dialogues with different unionists and loyalists and different factions of the Senate. The overriding piece that I hear from them is, oh, we'll not, we'll campaign against the Irish Union and we'll not vote for it. But if that's what the people vote for, that's what the democratic will of the people is. It's our home and we're still in. So we, they will accept the democratic outcome. The small minority says they won't, but they can't control the best of the the majority. I don't know if that answers question, but we will. We would want more than 50 plus one. No, I understand that. Yeah. Obviously. But I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't. That's, that's the rules. And that's the rules 
by and large, that should also be the But you seem to think that that, that 49 point something would go along with everything. Well, I would hope so, because what well, else? Everybody would, else? would hope so, but yeah. would they? Well, well, I would say his majority, history says otherwise, I think. I would say, and in my discussions with units, they would accept the outcome of it at all. And if they don't, what is their alternative? Could you could you have a perspective where a minority is stopping unity? Why would that happen? It would be contrary to the Good Friday Agreement. As the Good Friday Agreement says the British government must legislate or may come off it. And then what happens to Jackson's unionists? Who's it going to target? Because it's London actually legislates for unity. So there's a whole pile of scenarios now, but we'd like to see the maximum amount. And for those people who object to the unity, there's a notice on us to make this a welcome and bump for them and to deal with our concerns and their hopes. Well, at least we know we have a plan. It looks so. Yeah. We have Zoom questions. If, All right. if you don't. Just one more point. To your point, I think it might be worth mentioning here about what's actually happening right now back in Ireland with the Citizens' Assembly. We see a lot of prominent unionists um, speak to a united Ireland. So it's important, I think, for us to also realize that, yes, there are some extremists, but there's a lot of middle ground there, and they're already in conversations. There's a lot of advantages, maybe economic, to the unionist community. So we're seeing something move already. Yeah, so the discussions are live. You know, that's what I'm saying. We're not starting the discussion. The discussions are happening. And, what, and it comes back to the changes that the Good Friday Agreement made. So the Good Friday Agreement, there's a generation that's grown up, 25 years, generations grown up in peace, not known conflict that I've grown And so they're afraid, they're, they're, frame of reference is completely different and they're looking to the future. And there's people from who would have previously been in it from a unionist background are now discussing the future in terms of Irish unity. Brexit was a huge issue because Brexit took the people of the North out of the against the majority, the fifth and sixth percent, against, out of the EU. And there's young people from a Protestant background or from a unionist background that begin the question that they look towards Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and Mitzi Sunak, and West Message, and that's not the future. They have no interest in us. They want something new, and they're beginning to think their way through it. And what's really interesting, there was always a concept within unionism of the London. Some of you know London. London was the it was the Lord the Lieutenant of Derry. Yes, he the was. Governor of Derry. Yeah. And he, when the siege of Derry was on, he wanted to negotiate an agreement with the forces outside. And so the term Lundy was always, is a traitor. It's actually still part of an effort of Lundy every August. Yes, very. And it's, it's, so it was always anybody who thought outside the box or was always described as a Lundy or cast, cast from their own community. That's no longer the case. All that would say anything is breaking down. And there's a, a very interesting grey area development within society about what the future looks like. It's not just about, you know, people say it's orange and green. It's not, a, there's a rainbow of colours in between all that. People are finding a way out. But they're all looking at the future. So that's a really interesting piece. Economically, if you're a, far, if you're a farmer, and Brexit was applied to where it was going to be, there wouldn't be an agriculture left in the north. There wouldn't be a dairy farmer in business. And that's the damage that has been done to the economy. And that's the reason why the Brexit protocol is really important. So a lot of people are saying, well, where's my economic future? Is it in a Britain which is isolated from Europe? While you're on an island, with the vast majority of your market is in the 26, 90s, in Europe. So all of those things are really interesting discussions. And it always commands, there's a civic body called Ireland's Future. If you ever look towards their debates and discussions, and Irish unity and the economics of Irish unity is now uh, an academic uh, investigation. There's a project called the Erlens Project, which is between, uh, I think it's UCD, Penn State, and Queens. And it's a group of academics who are looking at what the United Ireland would like and how do you get there, and what would look like economically, socially, culturally. So it's not just us in this room having that debate, it's happening in business, it's happening in communities. It's happening in universities, which is pretty unheard of. 
it's no longer, it's no longer just as I keep on coming back, it's no longer an aspiration. It's a field of study, it's a field of debate, it's a live conversation. It's changing. It's changing. It's one of the takes on it. I got to do the Zoom. Yeah. Okay. okay so. These are hard questions. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. the last ones haven't been easy. <laughs> What I can't understand is how the Brits can hold up a government in the North. They lose, so they don't participate. The Unionists, that would be, yeah, it makes absolutely no sense in terms of, in terms of how you would normally think about politics. So it's cost of living crisis and it was an election. The government should be set up. People are finding it hard. Even getting money through the door, changing there's issues with budgets and all of that. So the obvious thing is to get back in the government. The, the unionists are saying they're not going to do it until the Brexit issue is resolved to their satisfaction. The North is no input. That's a negotiation between London and the EU. So the unionists should be back in the government in the North. Should be back in the partnership government with Sinn Féin and the other parties. And this is a bit of, this is where the logic goes a bit of screen. There's a school of thought that says it's not about Brexit. It's not about the protocol. What the issue actually is, is there's a Sinn Féin first minister. Mm -hmm. Sinn Féin's the largest party, which means you would have a unionist, deputy first minister. And unionism is not in the space to acknowledge that they have lost the majority. And they're not in the, they are not in the space to share a power or work alongside a first, a first minister from Sinn Féin, Catholic first minister, an Irish independent first minister, because that's not the state was set up for. So unionism has enjoyed being a majority for over 100 years. Just a, I mean, if, if politics is set for 100 years and suddenly it's turned on its head, some of them are rejecting the democratic outcome of the election. But they're rejecting the concepts of equality, people makes, and that's what's also clear in this. So we will find out in the coming weeks if a deal is struck in the protocol. What are the D are the DUP ever going to come back into our share as equals to serve alongside the Sinn Féin First Minister? So that's the reason why, just as much about the should be back in it's common sense and politics with the tip. You'd want to be in government at a time of crisis where people are suffering. But behind all of this, it's those fundamental shifts that I spoke about at the beginning. And unionism is not accepted. They have not accepted the rule. They are no longer an obvious majority in all the You touch on Ireland. And all the gatherings they have had in Dublin and Belfast, which included people from all political parties. Yeah, so I mentioned Ireland's future. So Ireland's future is a civic body. It's made up of academics, an awful lot of lawyers for some reason, parties, and commentators. And it's all about creating space in the deal for about Irish unity. They've been running for three to four years, I think. And they've held a number of discussions. It started off, I was the first one in Belfast in the Waterfront Hall. And I was really surprised because there was a couple of thousand people that turned up to that event. There were speakers from Fair Paul and Sinn Féin. But it was a northern thing. And that debate has increased. And I don't want to insult either Irish people or Irish Americans who share our common issue. We can be a bit mean in terms of our finances and money. At home. Yet, at the beginning, at the end of the summer, over 5,000 people had money out of their own pockets and euros to go to the, the, the point. I'm going to show my age now. I'm going to say the O2 point. The, 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 the arena in Dublin, 5,000 people had to go to a political discussion about Irish unity, which lasted the full day. And there was 10 parties represented on the platform, as well as others, talking about Irish unity. So that's the part that includes it was Fianna Fáil representatives, Fianna Gael representatives, ourselves, those representatives from a unionist background. But people paid money to attend. 
and they appeared and they came in huge numbers. Five thousand people came. But uh, well, it's normally a, a rock concert venue. Talk about Irish unity. So that's part of that debate that's going on in Ireland's future. And as I say, they have put their discussions up on the website, on their website, and on YouTube. And I encourage people that have a look. And I think the LA hits and AM hits last week. Had it uh, posted a, a web discussion with uh, Dr. Uh, Colin Hart, Professor Colin Hardy, Andre Murphy, and who else? Uh, Black. Oh, Francis Black. Francis Black. Francis Black. Francis Black. So yeah, that's all about how life the discussion is in Ireland. So that's, that's what Ireland future, but they can speak for themselves. And that's part of the planning, the preparation, and studying happening in that. It seems like everybody comes into the room and everything's on the table and we discuss what's the best way forward. And have that discussion and that sure views. I'm in a position where I would like to see maybe Ireland look like somebody else is a different one. So let's hear what it's all about planning and sharing. And the, the encouraging thing was, was 10 political parties right today talking about the overview of Irish Union. We'll agree on many things, but we agree that there's a need to do this. We now need to see the government do this. They need to do this. Not on there. Oh, I spilled down. I did something wrong, of course. You know why it's all false, but I just bored just okay. out of submission. Oh, here's a long one. The Irish have fought for this country for hundreds of years. They fought in the Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War I, and World War II. Many got off the boat and were drafted. Historically, since President Wilson's The Irish Problem has never been met head on, will you agree America has a role now? I don't understand why they drag their feet and don't take on Britain with a strong arm. I pass signs. I stand by Ukraine. Well, I stand by a united Ireland. What? can we as individuals do to bring this to a head? Say, I think there's, as an individual, have the discussion. Inform yourselves, read about it. Have a discussion with your family and friends, your civic societies. Read <laughs> all the politicians to safeguard the Good Friday Agreement. And in terms of implementing the Good Friday Agreement, including unity rather. Raise the issue with the Irish government. And say, why are you planning? Why are you considering this? But it's all about raising awareness, getting people involved in actions. And part of raising awareness could be a, a resolution in your union, could be a resolution in the city council, the state assembly, and Congress. So there's two, two resolutions at the minute going through Congress on the Good Friday Agreement. So all of those roles have got roles to play. And, and I would say, and I, just to make it clear, I think that the US government. Had a very fundamental role in determining the good, getting the Good Friday Agreement together, breaking the conflict, not the peace process. They've had a, they've played a, a, a huge role in like holding the British government to commit over Brexit. But I think they have a lot more to do. One caveat, or one piece to say that we believe in national self determination. But so for, and the Good Friday Agreement makes a claim so for the people of Ireland. To determine whether they are united or continue with the British. I'm not asking an, Ar an American government to take a position on that. There may be American politicians that do, you take no problem, but hopefully they're on the unity side. But we are, what we are asking America and the American administration and American politicians to say if you support the Good Friday Agreement, you support the right to a unity referendum. And that's the piece that needs to constantly be reinforced and enforced. And if you support that right, you support the right of me to have a say in the future of my country. Let's get that. Um, since the last election, it's two things that their own sort of calling, like in the North and in the South, they're separate from the actual turnout for the elections. So, you know, talk to people with, like sort of face to face, advocacy, yes, option bank to see. 
Excuse me. Would you repeat what the question is so the Zoomers could hear what she asked? Oh, I didn't know. I just asked it. She can hold the pole on the north and south. Yep, so it's the last election. In terms of our election, we will all parties do their own polling, but there's also public polls that have been conducted. So in terms of, there was actually a really interesting set of polls came out last weekend. So in the north, in terms of the electoral profile, Sinn Féin's at 31%. I think at the election maybe we're 29. So our vote in the north is actually and 29 was the highest point. So our votes continue to grow in the north. Uh and it basically union is it's shown that unionism and nationalism are neck and neck in terms of the north. In the south, in January 2020, when we became the largest party, we recorded our biggest ever vote at 25%. I was worried when I'm doing this stuff online because somebody was Googling them and I'm like, ah, it's 25.2. <laughs> 2. So 25%. Since then, the biggest worry for us or the biggest strategy for us was can we consolidate that vote? We'll bring it with us. Every vote has also around 33%, now, 31, 32, 33, 34%, with a 10 point lead over our next rivals. So not only have we consolidated the vote in the South, but we've actually increased it beyond our last high point. Now, there's not another election plan, probably at least, well, with the, the, the first of those in our two years. We want to see that increase again. And we want to see Sinn Féin lead in government. We want the election that was held in the North in May, the outcome of that respect in the government set up. So our polling on that issue shows that Sinn Féin continue to lead and extend their lead North and South. On the issue of Irish unity, there's all sorts of polls. I don't know, there was one that was an outlier at the unity position at 27%. Other ones have it in the high 40s and the low 40s. But again, I come back to their polls. Let's make it about the elections and who voted for that. But the big question on that is come back and, and ask the people. And depending on the question you answer, like most people in it will say that they expect a unity referendum within five years. So all of those polling data have been put in place and have been what they're, what they're ready for. Is, so everybody out. is there a letter template or standard letter we can all write to our local papers to get the word out? Well, that's part of our movement to people in this room if they want to draft that letter. <laughs> get that letter in. So and that's the key bit. You know, it's about having activism, it's about having make, make it easy for people to get involved, to get informed. So having a draft like here, so, but I mean, the other types of initiatives that we would encourage. Uh, I would also I mean and for Sinn Fein, I would also encourage people to check out Friends of Sinn Fein USA website to sign up for the Friends of Sinn Fein newsletter, which comes out every Friday, which is free. So we're not looking at any money for that. And that's a weekly update of what political issues are. And I will give a, like a, I do a letter every week, which is just normally my ramblings from the road when I'm traveling. But all that is about keeping them fun. So and hopefully we will move to a position where we have more information coming out, more calls to action. Must be really heartening with our newsletters, subscribers list. It's increased, but what is really good is the open rates, not on the board. But see, when you sign up the newsletter, we get to see how many people open it. And our open rates are twice the rates, twice what would be the normal political newsletter, which tells us that people are signing up are really engaged. And now people are coming to us and say, what do you want us to do? Which is fantastic for us. So what can be done? I'm looking to the activists in this room. See what you can do in your own organizations, see how you draft letters, how you contact Congress members. If there's anything you need from us, we'll give you it. But remember, we're an Irish political organization. Friends of Sinn Fein can help sustain or provide resort, their resort, the, the background information for people. So let's keep the dialogue going about what, what the next steps are. From, I'd like to add to that, ahead. please. Um, Martin Galvin, who um, is the head of uh, one of the organizations in the Hibernians, and Michael Cummings is the secretary for the American Brexit Committee. If you can get on their mailing lists, 
he's always said either one of them they're sending us stuff they send us stuff see if you can get this in the paper or and all you have to do is take out the you know ad name here and type it in and send it out and that's, we do a lot of that and i got two letters from joe biden and i got a letter from jack reed last week so if you want a letter from the president that's all you gotta do is write to him there you go so you were you were responsible for sick of hockey you forget the present that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason Chad went. He is actually. But that was the fact that sometimes people underestimate their own cost. Hmm. See, see if a Congress member gets a letter. They haven't, we, we bring our people into Washington. Suddenly they've got an interest in it. Or if we get them to come to Ireland with an interest in it. So all of that, yeah, this this can't just exist on well, we know activism. I'm a, I'm a real activist sitting right next door. Activism is what forces the pace of change and brings people along with you. The work that we, we do on the ground impacts on political leadership, impacts on government, impacts internationally. So that's the, the power in this room, the I'm back, I, I said it. The British government were going to impose a hard border back in Ireland. They didn't care about the good Friday agreement. It was the US, an act of the ground. They started talking to the Congress members. The Congress members, some of them are very well informed and very well inclined, inclined on the issue anyway. So you're pushing it in an open door. And then suddenly, the next thing, Joe Biden is at the G7 with Boris Johnson. And he says to Boris Johnson, you're not getting a treaty unless the Good Friday Agreement is protected. For those who follow the politics, every British Prime Minister, more or less the first call of Dane is the American President. With three British Prime Ministers in the last year, <laughs> all three of them formed the President, and all three of them, they talked about Ukraine. They talked about global war. They talked about Indochina. They talked about the Good Friday Agreement. That's how important it is. Your president, how important it is to the politics, and the president of the Senate, the British Prime Minister. This is important. This is up here with these issues and these things. And that is huge when you think about the size of Ireland, the issues which we face, and yet we are one of the three to four topics that the American president brings up with the British Prime Minister. Always. Always. Uh, Kathleen Savage, who we all know, yeah. said, we send letters for the McBride principles and also to get Jerry Adams a visa. And it all happened because of our activism. So we can do this for the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you, Kathleen. Absolutely. And there, there's the same. I mean, remember, Jerry Adams was born. The problem here, up until 1984, when it was a group of Irish Americans started raising the issue, wrote, he got in, the peace process took off, we end up with the Good Friday Agreement. So, I mean, all of that is hugely significant. The Spice Landmark came about the same way, getting the British out of the table on Brexit, came about from activism. So people's work counts. I mean, we know this is when we're remember the number strikers. We're, we're looking we look around this wall, the walls as holders, the, the proclamation. It's all come down. This is activism. It's not just a it's not just the the ten people from 1981, it's the hundreds of other prisoners and three. It's the thousands of people that took to the streets. It's tens of thousands of people across the world that remember Bobby Sands. That's what the important part is. It's those, the people in this room and the thousands like us, and we're the ones that can force it to change. And I'll come back to just one end because otherwise I'd be far, far over with that Come back to just this final point. The opportunities that we have, we can meet. We can, you know, Ireland. What to do to get it done? We have people to bring with us, persuade, but it's all very possible. 
and you will pass through to your friends. We got peaceful, democratic, and that's the opportunity that we now have. It's too good to miss, and it can't be missed. We owe it to people who came before us. As I said, it will be our legacy that people who come after. So uh, that was, a, I think we'll all agree, a very optimistic talk and um, gives us a lot to think about. Uh, I think we can honestly say that we're at a turning point here in Irish politics. The balance of power is shifting. Constitutional change is on the horizon. And we really could realize the aspirations of all those generations that went before us. And we have such an important role. And as being said here tonight, never underestimate your power for change. And so let's re-engage our representatives and let's send Kieran home with the message that we got this. Thank you. And now, of course, I got a few little announcements to keep us going here. I uh, want to let everybody know that we have a band uh, playing downstairs, the great name of the Rhode Island Gobshites, and they're going to sing for all of us tonight. And then I also would like to draw your attention to uh, one of our uh, further fundraisers for the Hunger Strike Monument that's coming up uh, on February 12th. And uh, you may see the flyers here. It's happening at Patrick's Pub, and uh, it will start at 10 a.m. until 1 p.m., and it's our traditional Irish breakfast. And I could tell you all the things that are going to be served there, but I'm just going to talk about my favorites. There's going to be Irish sausage, and there's going to be white and black pudding. <laughs> so I would love you all to come. It's for a great cause. You all know about the monument that we are so close to seeing. Uh, we have our date, which will be uh, May 21st for our opening ceremony. We're really close, and we encourage you all to come to that breakfast for one of our final fundraisers, really, because we're getting so close to our goals. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. And I have tickets to the breakfast. And I meant to say, Megan, or <laughs> Mavis has tickets, and you all have to buy them because it's her birthday. <laughs> thank you for coming out in the cold. Good. And I, I don't want to forget that we have a raffle going on.